Okay, I want to do just a little bit more with compactness and including continuity this time. Uh, compactness and continuity work really well together. The idea that continuous uh, functions have uh, inverses that take open sets to open sets, or the inverse image of an open set is open if the map is continuous, that works really well with that open cover idea. Um, so the first theorem we're going to prove is if uh, f maps a metric space x to a metric space y is continuous and e is a subset of x is compact, then the image f of e is compact. Okay, so f of e lives in y, e lives in x, but this continuous map, if you take the continuous image of a compact set, you get another compact set. So our proof uses open covers because that's how we prove things with compact sets. So let I want to prove that f of e is compact, so let's let O alpha be an open cover of f of e. Okay, so this is a bunch of open sets, and somehow I have to use the e is compact in x. Well, how do I get back to e? Well, I have to use this function that we're given as well. So I'm going to take the inverse image of each of these open sets, and that's going to give me an open set back in X. Let uh, F inverse of O alpha be the open inverse image of each O alpha. This is a cover of E. So obviously each of them are open because F is continuous, right? The inverse image of a continuous function, uh, or sorry. if we have a continuous function, the inverse image of an open set is open. So these are all open. And it's a cover too. Why is it a cover? Well, the O alphas cover the image of E. So to get into the image of E, if I look at everything that sends me to the image of E, E has to send me to the image of E. So if you just kind of do some arguments with uh, elements, so pick an element in E, show that it has to be in one of these F inverse O sub alphas. Uh, that'd be a good exercise if you if you don't see this right away. Okay, so this is an open cover of E. So there is a finite subcover. Say F inverse O alpha one. Union F inverse, move this over just a little bit, O alpha N. Alright, so I've got this finite subcover. And pushing it back forwards, using F on it push it back into y, we get that O alpha 1 union O alpha n is a finite subcover for f of e. So again, you might want to push around 
your ideas of what does it mean to be an inverse image and what happens if I take the function of an inverse image, where do I end up back, and that sort of thing. You might want to play with the elements of these sets just a little bit if you're not, you're not too comfortable with how loose we, we did this. Okay, so the theorem. If I take a continuous map, I have a compact set. If I hit that compact set with the continuous map, I end up with another compact set. Great. What makes that theorem very useful is when we send something that's compact into the reals. So here is kind of a big theorem that's going to be really useful for us. Let F map a metric space to the reals and E be a subset of X which is compact. Then there are say um, alpha in E and beta in E with f of alpha less than or equal to f of x less than or equal to f of beta for all x in E. Okay, what's this mean? So I've taken this compact set. So here's here's x and here's the reals. I've taken E, which is compact, and what happens, E, this is a continuous map, so E gets put down onto a closed bounded subset of R. And it puts it down onto a closed and bounded subset, that means that there's some point of E that gets mapped to here, this is going to be alpha, and there's some point of E beta which gets mapped to here. There's a minimum value and there's a maximum value and we can find exactly where those minimums and maximums came from. So let's prove this. Since F is continuous, I did say that, didn't I? I did not say that. Let F map X to R. Uh, this in red. Be a continuous function. It needs to be continuous. If it's not continuous, you can find uh, functions that don't take on their maximum or their minimum. Since f is continuous, f of e is compact in R. Therefore, it is closed and bounded i.e. the supremum, let's say, or let's go with a little m for the infimum, m, let the infimum, little m, of f of e and m, capital M, supremum, of f of e are in f of e. Right. If it's closed, it contains its infimum and its supremum. Um, so, and because it's bounded, it has an infimum and a supremum. So there exists. alpha in E with 
f of alpha equal to little m and beta in E with f of beta equal to capital M. So for any x in E, f of alpha is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to f of beta because this is the supremum and this is the infimum, everything else has to lie between them. Okay. I had almost forgotten continuity when I stated this theorem. Let's see why continuity is important. So let's just draw a graph from the reals to the reals. This will be a graph from the unit interval, so 0, 1. And we'll just send it in to 0, 1 as well. So 1, there's 0, there's 1. Let's draw a graph that is discontinuous and it doesn't take on its maximum or its minimum. Okay, so let's say at 1 half here, I'm going to take a function value of 1 half. And then on this side, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go increasing, so it's increasing up until there, and then on this side, I'm going to do the same thing, right? This doesn't actually have a maximum. Its supremum would be wherever this value is. Its infimum would be wherever this value is, but it's discontinuous, so it never actually takes on its maximum or never takes on its minimum. This is a compact set mapping not into a compact set, so continuity was really important there.